Good morning, ASFPMers, or afternoon, wherever you're listening from and watching. My name is Bruce Bender, and I'm an outreach and insurance consultant, but really, I'm a neophyte in the social and environmental justice arena. And speaking of that, I hope you got to attend that excellent plenary that was just held on social and environmental justice and managing flood risk. It sets up really well our next session entitled Addressing Social Justice and Floodplain Management which is E7. Now, if you wandered into E7 by mistake, that was a good mistake, as we have three dynamic presentations around this critically important topic. So grab a chair, headphones, and listen in. Hey, but, but before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsors whose financial support helps make this conference such a success. So let's take a brief moment to hear about one of our sponsors, Jacobs, and their flood resilient services. Jacobs Flood Resilience Services help communities prepare, mitigate, respond, and recover. To prepare, we partner with cities and agencies on ways to protect people and infrastructure. Flood hazard modeling and mapping helps to understand which assets are at greatest risk, including rivers and complex urban systems throughout the world. We also develop risk, climate resilience, and adaptation plans so agencies can target their work. We mitigate urban flooding by identifying infrastructure issues like aging or undercapacity sewers and by implementing award-winning green infrastructure programs and creating socially inclusive infrastructure. We protect our coastal communities as well by hardening facilities and designing barriers. We help communities respond and recover from disaster and work directly with FEMA to clear debris, restore utilities, and complete temporary and permanent repairs. Through technology, engineering, and science, we can create a more resilient planet. Hey, thanks again to Jacobs for being a sponsor and for the work you all do to help make this a more resilient nation. So let's move on to our first presentation, which today will be Flood Risk at the Frontline, Systemic Inequities in Floodplain Management, starring our own Jessica Ludi and Demaris Villalobos Galindo. Jessica is a Flood Risk Program Manager and is Silver Jackets Coordinator for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers there in the San Francisco District. And Demaris is a Project Engineer at Santa Clara Valley Water District. They both are on, though, the ASFPM Social Justice Working Group, which you'll hear more about. Jessica would like to clarify that this presentation does not reflect uh, the Army Corps' agency position, but it represents the work that she and Demaris have been doing in partnership with others from the Social Justice Task Force that Eileen will discuss after this. So let's sit back and listen. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for a discussion on a very important topic. Um, this presentation, so that you know, is intended to connect to the following presentation by Eileen Shader, also on social justice. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that there are many people who have come before us working in civil rights and in environmental justice, and there are also many communities of color who have been advocating for years for better flood mitigation. We are building from their work to start a discussion to make floodplain management more equitable and just. Damaris and I are still learning and we are not anti-racist educators or diversity and inclusion experts, though we are floodplain managers who are passionate about those, this work and about ensuring that those community members who have been historically marginalized can benefit equitably from our practice. Our discussion today will cover some sensitive topics and may make some of us feel a little uncomfortable to hear, and that's okay. Uh, we try to approach this very objectively, looking at lots of data and research. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat and after the presentation, uh, and we hope that this is the first of many conversations to shine light on the inequities in our practice and build a more equitable future. 
Systemic inequities affect every part of the flood risk management cycle, making people of color less able to prepare for, respond to, and recover from flooding. For just three quick examples, studies show that people of color are often excluded from the planning and uh, mitigation process. Studies show that low-income people of color can sometimes lack the resources to evacuate during a flood. For example, they may not have a car or can't afford fuel or a hotel room. And finally, studies show that after a storm, neighborhoods of color are often the last to have power restored. What we also know is that on top of this, it makes pre-existing inequities worse. As a result, communities of color disproportionately carry the burden of flooding and feel the impacts more significantly than others. In addition, many under-resourced communities are already dealing with compounding environmental justice issues like adjacent pollution or degraded infrastructure. Now this matters because we're talking about the livelihoods of communities who have been historically marginalized and have the least economic resources and power to reduce their risk. In addition, this is important because by 2060, people of color will represent roughly 57% of the US population. This is not an issue that can remain unaddressed. So who else is significantly affected by flooding and floodplain management? The Natural Hazard Center describes socially vulnerable populations as those who face disproportionate disaster risk due to a variety of historical, social, economic, and political factors. To be clear, there is nothing intrinsic about these individuals or people with these identities that make them vulnerable. Their vulnerability is caused by external factors. Now we acknowledge that there are many groups and identities who are disproportionately affected by floods. This presentation, however, will focus on communities of color. Last year's racial justice protests sparked debate in the profession about our role as floodplain managers in advancing justice. Some people wanted to continue to do our jobs business as usual but we're making the case today that because of the historical discriminatory policies and the inequities that they created, a business as usual approach will perpetuate inequality, even if we don't intend to. As floodplain managers with good jobs, platforms, access to knowledge and resources, we have an opportunity to build resilience for all of those we serve, especially our most vulnerable. But how did we get here and what can we do about it? Today's talk will look at what makes people vulnerable to flooding, how historical policy and practice has contributed to vulnerability, and finally, a brief note on what we hope to be able to do about it. So before we go too far, what do we mean by social justice? Well, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. And there are many similar versions of this definition across a number of sources. Uh, and although social justice principles also vary slightly from source to source, they all tend to converge around at least these four principles, which include access, equity, participation, and human rights. Thank you very much, Jessica, for that great introduction. So how did we get here? One of the things that Jessica and myself wanted to do as flat play managers in order to understand how we got here was to look at vulnerability using an objective lens. What does it mean to have vulnerability to flooding? And what are some of those factors that increase or decrease vulnerability? So as it turns out, there is a lot of information out there already. It was just a matter of compiling it, process it, and present it. Flood vulnerability is the extent to which a system is susceptible to floods due to exposure in conjunction with, with its incapacity or capacity to be resilient, to cope, recover, or adapt. More importantly, vulnerability, we found that is related to three main factors, three main variables, exposure, susceptibility, and resilience. As exposure increases, vulnerability increases, susceptibility increases, then vulnerability increases, and as resilience increases, vulnerability decreases. Now, in the next slides, I'll present and, and explain what, in more detail what some of those uh, variables are um, mean. But before I do that, 
one of the in the definition of flood vulnerability we talk about systems so what do we mean by this in the context of floodplain management the system is composed of three main components the natural component the socioeconomic and the institutional the natural are those riverine and coastal systems in which physical chemical and biological processes take place institutional are those administrative and institutions and systems where decisions, planning, and management processes happen. And socioeconomic includes the human factor and all those activities associated with humans. So when Jessica and myself are talking about vulnerability, we're talking about the vulnerabilities of the system and not just people. Now on to the first of those variables that affect vulnerability, which is exposure. Exposure are the values that are present at the location where floods happen, including goods, infrastructure, and people. So mainly is the spatial aspect of vulnerability. And I wanted to explain exposure with this picture, which is actually three pictures of the same location taken at different times. These are uh, actually uh, pictures that uh, we um, came up with for my project that I'm working right now uh, currently. And the first picture on the left side was taken in 1939. It's an aerial picture of an area in the city of San Jose in Silicon Valley. And in the red dotted lines, you can see the width of the historical floodplain. And you can also see the land use back then, which is mainly farmland and orchards. Now, moving forward to 2002, we can see that land use changed from farmland to residential, a mix of industrial as well as open space. Now, moving forward to 2017, same location, in the blue uh, polygon, we can actually see the inundation extent during a flood event that happened in 2017, where approximately 14 thousand people were evacuated. And what we're trying to um, present here is basically how the people that live in this community here illustrated at the bottom uh, right corner of each of the second and third pictures, how the exposure for those people are very high to flooding. So what are some of the variables that increase exposure? Closeness to inundation area, populations close to the coastline, population density, land use, ground surface elevation. What are some of the questions that we as flat plain management managers can ask ourselves and also ask of our communities in order to understand their exposure are, where do you live? What is our history of housing policy? Has everybody had equal opportunities are choosing where to live? Now on to the next variable, which is susceptibility. This picture is actually of uh, the same project that I just talked about, but this is a public meeting where we invited some of those people that got affected by the flooding. And susceptibility are those conditions in the social context that make institutions people more prone to harm due to flooding. In this specific picture, what we are trying to show is how easy are you making it for everybody in the community that is affected to attend these types of meetings? Are you actually having uh, people translate into another language if the demographics show that you need to have another language other than English uh, in these public meetings? Public meetings can be very intimidating. So who are who is sitting at the table and what type of resources are you um, having at these meetings to make participation more inclusive? Uh, so what are some of the variables that increase susceptibility? Education, uh, the percent of elderly in a specific area, mobility status, communication penetration rate, what language is the information transmitted in, human health, uh, income. And what are some of the questions that we can ask as flat plain managers to understand susceptibility? Who lives where? What is your income level, education level? Are you informed about your risks and how likely is it that institutions are investing equally in all neighborhoods? And now on to resilience. Resilience is the ability to cope and recover. And this, uh, in this image, we're showing some of those measures that increase resilience in a specific community. These pictures are also associated with a project I'm working on currently. The picture at the top shows a proposed berm to make the community more resilient. The picture at the bottom left shows a proposed flood wall and the picture at the bottom right shows uh, some of the, those non-structural measures such as education and outreach. So what are some of those variables that uh, can increase resilience? 
a warning system. Is there a warning system in, in the community? Is there a community emergency action plan or a hazard mitigation plan? Is there investment in flood risk mitigation measures, both structural and non-structural? Are you designing room for the river through open space? Again, what are some of the questions that we can ask ourselves as flood play managers to understand resilience in a specific community? Does the community participate in the National Flood Insurance Program? Are there investments in flood risk mitigation measures? Is everybody in the community able to access a flood mitigation system? So in a nutshell, those variables that affect vulnerability include exposure, susceptibility, and resilience. And I challenge you as we continue with this presentation and as Jessica talks about those historical practices and policies to understand or to try to associate some of those policies with these factors and see how they increase or decrease vulnerability. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Damaris. <clears throat> so how did we get here? Taking a look at historical policy and practice. Numerous historical government policies reduced access for African Americans to housing, employment, fair wages, education, health care, and also to voting. And this created an uneven playing field to start with. Um, the effects of these external factors are still present today, and they increase the exposure of African Americans um, and the susceptibility to flooding. I won't talk about all of these today because of time, but suggest that if you're interested, you look up some of these key milestones, laws, and court decisions. Um, they directly resulted in creating some inequities that we still see today. Another key historical piece of legislation was the Flood Control Act of 1936. Among other provisions, this law established the requirement that the benefits of federal flood control projects must outweigh the costs. This requirement is also a part of many other federal grant programs, like FEMA's hazard mitigation programs, for example. In my limited time with the Army Corps of Engineers, this requirement appears to me as arguably the most significant factor in determining where we build projects, what kind of projects we build, or if the benefits don't outweigh the costs, whether we build a project at all. Um, but an unintended consequence of this policy can be that applying a benefit cost analysis can result in prioritizing federally funded projects for communities with resources over those without resources. For example, if you live in a neighborhood with low cost housing, it could very well be that the costs of protecting your community will be greater than the assessed value of the homes and therefore the federal government won't fund the project. On the other hand, if you live in a wealthy neighborhood, it is much more likely that the value of houses is greater than the cost of flood protection, making it more likely that you'll get the federal support. Low-income communities, who are often communities of color, do not benefit equitably, equitably from federal flood and recovery programs. Um, Federal mitigation projects and grants require our local partners to share in the project costs. Now this makes sense from a federal taxpayer standpoint, we want local communities to have skin in the game. But if we're talking about multi-million dollar projects or in some case, billion dollar projects, then this provision will require low income or will prevent low income communities from even coming to the table. Next, in order to be eligible for disaster assistance, the property you live in must meet some minimum damage threshold, and the payout that you get is directly related to the amount of damage that was caused to your home. This requirement hurts people who live in lower cost housing because the economic damage would be less relative to the same amount of damage in a high cost house. You'll therefore get a lower payout or you might not even meet the threshold to get any assistance. Next, there is very little assistance available for people who can't demonstrate that they own their home. So this means renters or people who have passed down property through the generations, which is common for many African-American communities in the South. Finally, some people can't get assistance simply because they don't have the ability to meet with FEMA, either because they work at a job that doesn't allow them to take time off or because they have dependents at home that require their full-time care. 
um, these external factors increase the susceptibility and decrease resilience to flooding. Then here's a list of still more federal policies and practices that disproportionately limit communities of color from recovering from flooding. I won't talk about them all today, um, but on, on the left, the article um, talks about how the Small Business Administration distributes disaster loans after a flood to help individuals and damages uh, or, and businesses <laughs> repair their damaged property. Um, they base the loans on the applicant's credit score, which disproportionately affects people of color who have lower credit scores. Um, these low credit scores can in turn be tied back to some of the discriminatory policies that we discussed earlier. So there is a cyclical effect that is present today. After Hurricane Matthew in 2016, this article shares how the SBA frequently denied African-Americans disaster loans at much greater late rates than they denied loans to white families. Um, and on average, white applicants received more money than black applicants when loans were eventually approved. This article also found that across the SBA over the course of the last 20 years, the SBA has distributed nearly $40 billion in taxpayer funded disaster loans in a racially disparate manner that has given white areas billions of dollars more to rebuild than black areas. Next on the list, um, stormwater and urban flooding are significant risks facing communities of color, partially because of historical disinvestment in these communities. However, FEMA uh, flood insurance rate maps do not map stormwater typically, and many agencies or projects like my own aren't authorized to address stormwater. We have to instead just focus on the coastal or the riverine flooding silo. And so the exposure remains unaddressed. Last year, Virginia's emergency manager, Curtis Brown, testified to Congress that the practice of disaster management is too white. Back when we used to have conferences in person, I could look around the room and probably make the same assessment of the floodplain management profession. It's rather white and homogenous with me, white lady working for the federal government as exhibit A. Now, there is nothing inherently wrong with being white in floodplain management, especially if you're this guy. Um, this is just a bad pun, my floodplain friends. If you don't know who this is, this is Gilbert White, the father of floodplain management. Uh, jokes don't always translate well over webinars, but I'll presume that you're laughing on the inside. In any case, <laughs> in all seriousness, there is nothing inherently wrong with being white in floodplain management. Um, however, if most floodplain management practitioners are white, while well, many of those that we serve are not white, then how can we expect to understand the broad range of perspectives and challenges faced by our constituents of color? And how can we be sure that our solutions are meeting their needs? On my first day of graduate school, a professor sat us down and told us that the power of individuals in environmental planning basically comes down to determining whether the nuclear reactor built in your neighborhood will be blue or green. And what he meant was that those people most affected by a nuclear reactor were not involved early when the location was cited, nor whether um, it was even decided that a nuclear reactor was necessary at all. The same process happens with flood mitigation. The people most affected from floods or from flood mitigation are often left out. So putting this all together, if people are facing pre-existing inequities due to historical government policy, and if federal resources are not going to where they are most needed, and if floodplain management practitioners don't understand or relate to the unique perspectives of our constituents, and finally, if marginalized communities are left out of planning and decision-making, then it is likely that we are going to contribute to this cycle of inequality and flood vulnerability. If we want justice and equity, we have to interrupt this cycle on many levels. Thank you, Jessica.
So what can we do about this? Um, and even though we wish we had the silver bullet to solve this problem, um, we know that we need the collaboration of everyone, especially flat plain managers who are well positioned to build resilience for all communities in an equitable manner. However, we need to understand the problem first, hence the intent of this presentation. Now, Jessica and myself came up with a, a suggestion list. Uh, it's a short list, but we know that the other presentations in this session is gonna, are gonna have um, more suggestions uh, of what we can do to level the playing field. Now to start that conversation, some of the things that we can do are establish trust and relationships with historically marginalized communities, remove barriers to participation in flat play management preparation, response, and recovery decisions, prioritize and allocate funding to projects that advance social and environmental justice, recruit and hire a workforce that looks like the communities we serve, representation, that is something that I believe is very important. Diversify, ensure diversity, representation, and perspectives in all panels that we organize or special advisory boards that we establish and remove obstacles to participation. And look critically, look critically not only at the projects, but also the policies that we implement to see how and where they might cause or exacerbate harm and when they leave some communities behind. And with this, we want to thank you for your time and we're open for any questions that you might have. Thanks. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Jessica and Emerys for this uh, eye-opening presentation. I, I like the putting this together slide. And of course, Jessica, everybody's got to love your pun. Uh, good, good laughter. We got some comments out there. In fact, let's take a look at a couple of questions uh, we'll look at the first one up there uh, by Joe Cecil says he laughed as soon as the photo of Gilbert White came up. Uh, another one, an old white guy uh, laughing at the Gilbert White joke. So um, people are listening and, and love uh, a little uh, humor into the presentation. Uh, but somebody asked here, do you guys have all these references available that can be shared and where would they go to get that? I see some heads nodding, Jessica. Yeah. The, um the last slide in the presentation has a list of um, some of the references we used, but um, we could probably, um, I mean, I, and I know the slides will be available, I think for the next six months. So that's a great place to go to get them. Is, is AS, and I don't, I don't want to be stealing anything from Eileen, but is ASFPM going to have uh, a tab or something uh, for the social justice work group by chance that these might go up on? I think that's a great idea. Okay. Eileen, chat. Write, that, write that one down. <laughs> uh, there you go. And, and chat if you're listening, hopefully. Um, so uh, let's see what other ones have. Is, is there a place uh, where we can share stories and experiences uh, similar to some of that we've heard um, today? Um, is, do you know of any storyboard or a place where people can put up similar stories? Uh, yeah, well, the social justice task force, I was waiting for Jessica to respond, <laughs> but uh, we do have um, a drive that um, actually Eileen, who's going to present later, started, but we were thinking that we're going to put all our um, kind of experiences or what we hear from the communities we're working with in there. Uh, it's not very formal yet because we're not a committee, we're a task force hoping to become a committee, but uh, you can contact us, any of us, Jessica, myself, or Eileen, uh, and we can guide you into where to put this and maybe get some recommendations on how to make it a little bit more formal. Great. Um, we have one pop up. Lori, who was uh, one of the presenters uh, on, the, on the plenary, said she's sorry she has to leave, uh, but wanted to thank the panelists for uh, their session uh, and to thank Eileen and Jessica for you guys helping establish that social justice work group. Um, a question around substantial improvement, substantial damage. Can you expand upon some of the equity challenges uh, and problems around that might be around uh, substantial improvement, substantial damage? I can take a stab at it. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm not sure what F SI means, but I think that SD means substantial, substantial damage thresholds. I guess um, my understanding um, 
Matthew, uh, of, of that issue. And, and this one really came out from a bunch of ASFPM uh, committee co-chairs brainstorming ideas and ways that we could um, think about potentially inequitable policies. So uh, if I get this wrong, maybe uh, uh, Jen Marcy can correct me. But um, my understanding with some of the substantial damage um, threshold issue is that um, if you want to do um, an improvement on your home, for example, um, I believe that you would be required to right, uh, comply then when you, it, it, if you're changing enough of your, um, enough of your structure, you would be required to comply with the latest, um, NFIP requirements. And if you live in a low cost house, then that would trigger, uh, sooner than it would if you live in a high cost house. Then the issue that we explained in the presentation, and actually since uploading the presentation, I've drawn some graphics to try to illustrate this. But if let's say you had two houses next to each other, side by side, I guess that's what next to each other means anyway. <laughs> and you had the same amount of, uh, you know, two feet of water across the door for both of them. Um, the low cost house would sustain less property damage economically, whereas the high cost house would sustain greater uh, economic damage um, from that flood. And the amount of funding that you would be eligible for would also be disproportionately lower or higher. Um, and as I understand it, that in some cases that might not even be high enough to get any damage at all because there is a minimum damage threshold. So I hope that answers the question. And if not, I I welcome folks to correct that in the chat. Right, and it's the SI substantial improvement applies similarly, I would think as well. Thanks. Um, uh, let's see, we have a uh, bad day for those who knew Dave. Dave Fowler is asking, uh, one of the, especially since he called one of our panelists just before we started, one of the issues is to get flood mitigation project teams to meet and really listen to the least resilient communities. What strategies can you suggest to do this, uh, Demaris? Yeah, um, one of the strategies that uh, I've used personally uh, at Valley Water is to work with nonprofit organizations that already have a relationship with that community uh, because uh, we talked about this in the presentation, but there is a lack of trust for valid reasons to, to government, local, state, federal, and, and communities uh, usually um, trust you know the nonprofits that have helped them through pretty difficult times as an example and Jessica also knows about these uh this flood event that I kept talking about in 2017 affected a Vietnamese community in a very big way and the the nonprofit that stepped up to help them you know uh they trust them and they have the they understand that they have their best interests at heart so what I would recommend is is um, making this partnership stronger and finding those community groups that already have a good relationship with, with the public, starting by that, but also, and I always say this, representation, right? Uh, representation in the field. Uh, I've noticed, I mean, personally at Valley Water, where I'm at, um, I'm the first project manager that is Latina, right? So uh, at least with this project. So it was the relationship that I had with the public especially the public that was, you know, Latinx and Latinx community was different from uh, the response that they've had in the past. So I feel that representation in the field is very important. Let me, uh, we're, we're running out of time and we've got a lot of questions. Uh, let me quickly pick up on one here. Uh, what strategies or resources have been identified to help risk communities, which are at risk communities, sorry, which have various land home ownership schemes such as tribal um, native Alaskan Hawaiian etc uh, and if you want to try to answer that I can do an initial um, uh, take on it um, so this will be an incomplete answer but uh, I know that both FEMA and the Army Corps have programs or specific allocations that allow us and encourage us to work with tribes and disadvantaged communities um, in some cases, we are then able to waive the cost share partially or entirely. Um, for example, uh, Army Corps, Silver Jackets, interagency non-structural projects, um, it's no cost share to the local community or tribe. And we do a lot of work with tribes and disadvantaged communities that way. Um, the only sort of 
cost share is in-kind work from that community and then a number of other partner agencies. So that's one way, um, but certainly it's not um, exhaustive nor enough. Um, Damaris, maybe you'd like to add? No, I think you got it. <laughs> well, there are a lot of great questions and compliments in the, uh, the chat. And so thank you all. We could keep going just like we did on the plenary, but we've got two others. So maybe the question will bubble back up. Um, but let's move on to the next uh, presentation, uh, which dovetails nicely, though, with this one. And I believe, Jessica and Damaris, you'll be back for some of the Q&A. Uh, this one's going to be presented by Eileen Shader, who, you, for those who are at the plenary, got to hear her uh, moderate and do a fabulous job doing that. She's director, as you heard, River Restoration and American Rivers, and also on the ASFPM's uh, Social Justice Working Group. And in fact, Eileen is now going to tell us more about that very working group, which we had some questions on. So uh, let's have a listen. Hi, my name is Eileen Shader. I'm director of River Restoration for American Rivers, a national conservation nonprofit that works to protect wild rivers, restore damaged rivers, and conserve clean water for people and nature. I'm co-chair of ASFPM's Natural and Beneficial Functions Committee. And today I'm speaking on behalf of the ASFPM Social Justice Working Group, which was formed last summer by a number of your policy committee chairs. The working group is made up of volunteers. Uh, we are by no means experts on social justice, myself included. Each of us is on our own individual journey to learn about social justice and take action within our lives. We recognize that everyone is at a different place on their individual journey. Um, so we invite you to listen to understand and learn with us today. We felt it was important to start a working group in which we could create a space and a platform for ASFPM members to work together to address inequalities within floodplain management. And on behalf of the working group, I'd like to thank the board and the executive team for encouraging and supporting us as we've been working through these issues this year. <clears throat> I'd also like to start by um, recognizing and acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Susquehannock people. The Susquehannock were an Iroquois-speaking nation, also known as the Conestoga, and they were a confederacy of several dozen tribes from the start of the Susquehanna River in southern New York through uh, central and eastern Pennsylvania and into present-day Maryland. There are no federal or state-recognized tribes in Pennsylvania today due to centuries of violence, genocide, disease, and forced removal. However, Native people live throughout the Commonwealth today, and the pl many places, natural features, and plants and wildlife throughout our region bear native names. Uh, if you are aware of whose native land you reside on, then I encourage you to uh, add that to the chat. Let us know uh, where you're coming from today. Uh, if you're not aware, then Native Land Digital Map is a great indigenous-led resource for North Americans to learn more about their local indigenous territories and languages. My colleagues uh, Jess and Damaris just gave a fantastic presentation on social justice and floodplain management. So this presentation is intended to pick up where they left off by diving deeper into what <clears throat> ASFPM can do to advance social justice within our organization. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about why um, ASFPM should be working to advance social justice, what some of our friends and allies are doing in this area. <clears throat> talk a little bit about how we created the Social Justice Working Group and what we've been up to so far and what we're hoping to do moving forward. If you've done any work in the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion world, then you've likely heard some of these key terms before, but um, that'd be useful to just do a quick recap in case anyone's joining us uh, just now. <clears throat> diversity is recognizing the many differences between people. This includes racial, ethnic, income, faith, LGBTQ populations, people with disabilities, rural um, versus urban, et cetera. Equity is the fair treatment of all people and recognizing their partic particular needs, preferences, and challenges of groups of people. Inclusion refers to the degree to which diverse individuals are enabled to participate fully in, in decision-making, creating space and opportunity for traditionally excluded groups to participate. A truly inclusive group is diverse, but a diverse group may not be inclusive. 
To work towards diversity, equity, and inclusion is to work towards justice. Justice means equal access to wealth, opportunities, and privilege. Working towards social justice may mean addressing the present day impacts of past inequalities in order to achieve equity going forward. Equity is not the same as equality. The concept of equity is synonymous with fairness and justice. It can be helpful to think of equity as not simply a desired state of affairs or a lofty value. To be achieved and sustained, equity needs to be thought of as structural and a systemic concept. Equity means knowing that there's a right-sized solution to each individual, while justice means working to correct the system itself, tackling systemic racism itself. So why is it important for ASFPM to explicitly work towards justice? Well, our vision reflects our intent to create an adaptable nation resilient to flooding. I think we've all assumed that our vision and mission are intended to include everyone, right? Well, over the past couple of years, we've seen many articles and studies published that discuss the inequities that exist within flood management. The ASFPM Policy Committee Chair started exploring uh, these issues last year um, and uh, trying to identify whether our work um, benefits everyone equally. During some of our very extended email discussions on this topic, we discussed the perspective of some that water doesn't care about race. The truth is that water doesn't have to be racist when the policies and the practices are. It became clear to us that as an association, we need to start having a long overdue conversation about inequities and flood management, what we as an association could do to address them. Um, as I mentioned, there's a growing body of evidence that clearly demonstrates that systemic inequalities exist in the policies and practices of every part of the flood risk management cycle. As floodplain managers, we play a role in each of these stages of the flood cycle. So don't we have, as an association who represents this community, have an obligation to work to address those these inequities where they exist? We have uh, 14 volunteer-led policy committees uh, that guide much of ASFPM's policy work uh, in all of these various areas of flood risk management. So last summer, a handful of the committee chairs began to talking about uh, what we could do to drive discussion of social justice issues forward. We had our virtual committee chair retreat last year. Uh, we invited speakers from the NAACP, Enterprise Community Partners, and uh, we started to discuss issues of inequity. We concluded that the issues within floodplain management are cross-cutting across all of our committees and that um, we needed to establish a working group that would be able to uh, work across all of these issue areas and help guide uh, ASFPM forward. One of the first things that many have started to do was look around to figure out who else uh, within our world and our allies um, is working on justice and equity so that we can learn from them, get a better sense of what it means to work towards justice as an association and a nonprofit. Speaking from my own experience working for an environmental nonprofit, um, working towards justice has meant completely changing the way that we conduct our work and our internal culture. My organization, American Rivers, like many conservation organizations, started working on DEIJ issues following an assessment of the environmental sector in 2014 that found we had hit a ceiling of 12 to 14% in racial composition of, our, of environmental organization staff. There's alienation and unconscious bias hampering recruitment and retention of people of color. Today, most, uh, most conservation groups are proactively reconciling with not just those issues, but also the history of racism and classism that the environmental, uh, many of the environmental founder, movement's founders um, held. American Rivers established an internal DEI committee five years ago to initiate a staff-led effort to address DEI issues within our organization. We hired a DEIJ consultant that works with conservation nonprofits to guide us through this process. They led trainings, performed a culture and climate assessment, 
and worked with our committee to develop a DEI action plan for our organization staff and our board. This plan outlines how we are committed to centering DEI uh, into our river conservation work, our river policy work, and our organizational practices and culture. It's not just ASFPM's partners in the environmental community that have been taking on this work in recent years. Um, many different associations um, have been as well. Uh, for example, the American Planning Association uh, established a social uh, equity task force and diversity and inclusion strategy in 2018. They have a pretty robust collection of planning resources, training series, and videos that they've produced on DEIJ topics. And they have DEIJ committees in 18 of their state chapters. There are many groups out there that um, have experience working with communities of color and low, or low income that have already done much of the work to identify what needs to change in the field of flood management. Groups like NAACP, Low Income Housing Coalition, and the Anthropocene Alliance work directly with community leaders in flooded communities. There's a lot that we can learn by listening to them and learning from these leaders who have been working really intentionally to make space for the most impacted and least privileged people in communities. Uh, final reason I'd suggest that we need to proactively work to center justice in our work as floodplain managers is a shifting focus on underserved communities from the federal level. One of the first actions President Biden took when he came into office was to sign an executive order that instructs all agencies to assess whether underserved communities and individuals face systemic barriers in accessing benefits and opportunities within their programs and to take steps to address them. Uh, while this may take some time to address some of the longstanding issues like benefit cost analysis and uh, providing better training for the federal workforce, um, we are starting to see impacts at every agency and how they work, uh, the incentives and resources that are available to communities of color and low income. So what can we as ASFPM members do to advance justice? As the working group started uh, talking through these things last year, we uh, one of the first things we, we recognized is that ASFBM is an organization with multiple com components and levels, um, the board, executive staff, flood science center, foundation, chapters, et cetera. And while there's work to be done within each of these levels, um, and we wanted to start by focusing on what we as uh, volunteer committee leads could have an ability to impact. <clears throat> We, our uh, group was initially con, uh, consisted of uh, committee chairs. We had a couple of board members join um, and also have a staff liaison to the executive team. Since then, we've had a number of, um, of members express interest in joining um, the group. So we're looking forward to expanding that in the future. <clears throat> we determined that the uh, first thing we needed to do was to obtain buy-in and commitment from the board by having them adopt a policy statement. Uh, the ground for a policy statement was laid last year. Uh, the 2020-2021 goals and objectives included this goal of uh, developing a policy on social justice. <clears throat> and uh, we got buy-in from Carrie Johnson, the board chair, to, um, to have the working group pull together a draft policy statement that the board could consider um, that would lay out a vision for how the association could proceed. Now, hopefully the board will be, will have approved the, the social justice statements um, at their board meeting on May 7th. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can uh, add a, a link to that final approved uh, policy in the chat. Um, but just to give you an idea of what was uh, included in the draft, uh, we included a statement of pur purpose that focuses on making ourselves as community uh, as a community of floodplain managers more diverse and inclusive and to work to promote justice in floodplain management policy and practice. We also identified uh, many examples of injustice uh, that exist in floodplain management <coughs> and we acknowledged our obligation um, and com made commitments to work towards cultivating diversity 
promoting equity, and fostering inclusion among our members and within the floodplain management community. So what does it look like to do the work of advancing justice within floodplain management? As a committee, we're hoping to figure that out as we move forward. We know that we want to create a space for ASFPM members to, make, to take a look at where inequity occurs within ourselves, within the policies and practices that guide our field, and in how we conduct our work in our jobs and organizations. I mentioned at the outset that everyone is on a different place in their social, social justice journey. We hope that our working group will be able to create a space for members to learn and grow on their individual journeys. We want to help ASFPM members to consider equity in their daily practice. Do your actions create equitable outcomes? Do you unintentionally contribute harm to already vulnerable groups? Help a member, we wanna help members determine how to educate themselves on the history and culture of communities you serve at the beginning of every project, to seek out, share, and amplify under-resourced perspectives, to learn to build trusted and lasting relationships with historically marginalized communities within their service areas, <clears throat> to engage the most vulnerable and most affected groups in a project area early and give them a say, to be mindful that when you may, of when you may be dismissing local knowledge or um, in favor of outside expert opinion. We also hope to work at the systemic level. ASFPM has the capacity to influence and inform policymakers and institutions in the floodplain management field. We hope to develop a policy platform for the organization that can promote uh, policy reforms that replace policies that perpetuate inequity with those that advance justice for historically marginalized communities. We want, to improve, we want to advance improved practices that agencies use to reach out to and engage communities of color and low income. We want to prioritize federal technical assistance programs, mitigation and recovery funding for frontline communities. We want to help remove barriers for, to access for under-resourced communities. And finally, we hope that we can uh, help our community to grow together. We have to educate the floodplain management community about the historical inequities and the current systemic inequities that exist in floodplain management. As I said, we hope to identify floodplain management policies and practices that exacerbate or cause harm and advocate to replace them with more equitable ones. We have to promote transparency within our organizations, agencies, and institutions to, to diversify the floodplain management profession, including boards, panels, committees, and providing space for members that haven't felt heard in the past. <clears throat> and to promote cross-discipline collaboration around issues that directly affect flood vulnerability, affordable housing, emergency response, transportation and mobility, social services, et cetera. So looking ahead at the coming year, um, we know we can't do all of that right away. So we've discussed some of the first actions that we can take as a working group um, in, in the future. <clears throat> These include uh, encouraging the board and the executive office to hire a DEI consultant to help uh, walk the organization through this process. I really can't say enough about the importance of having experts uh, lead, uh, lead an organization as they're exploring these issues and identifying um, things that might need to change. We have to host listening sessions so that we can learn from our partners about their DEI journeys. Um, and it's better to understand the issue. We want to better understand the issues that our members are facing um, and get a better sense of what, as a working group, we should, be, we should be focusing on. We hope to draft a white paper on the systemic inequalities that uh, exist within floodplain management and develop the policy recommendations that ASFPM can pursue moving forward. And we hope to provide benefits to our ASFPM membership by utilizing existing newsletters to share resources and tips, and hopefully hosting meetings, webinars, trainings, um, in order to provide more information and education to our, um, to our membership. The Social Justice Working Group, like all of our policy committees, is entirely volunteer-based. 
We can only do the work and be successful if we create a bigger and more inclusive table. We'll be putting a link in the, to a Google form within the chat. I encourage you all to fill this out if you'd like to join the working group. If you'd like to be on a list to receive updates and invitations to events, or if you'd just like to provide some feedback on what you think the social justice working group should be working on. Thank you very much for joining today's session. And I look forward to working with all of you to advance justice within floodplain management. Thanks, Eileen, uh, for letting us know about this important uh, working group and, and what other groups are, are doing out there. And being as a equity neophyte, I really appreciated and liked how you boiled down those basic definitions and some visual aids there. Uh, we do have a few minutes and we have gotten a lot of, of comments and, and response to uh, some of your points there. Let me pull one of the first ones up. Uh, have you, and, and for those uh, listening, we've also pulled back, uh, brought back Jessica and Damaris also to help out um, since they're all on the working group. Robin Williams writes, uh, have you encountered pushback when discussing these issues with stakeholders? And if so, how did you overcome that? Um, that is definitely a good question. Um, and I think the answer is yes, definitely. I think in, especially in trying to tackle um, these issues at, uh, you know, this broader institutional level and sy systemic level, um, we inevitably um, can receive pushback um, and not necessarily because I think people are, um, I think, you know, at large people perceive themselves to not be racist and to not have, um, um, prejudice against different people. And in general, it, my experience is that it often tends to be a result of just not having learned enough um, and not being aware of the challenges that um, many in our society are facing. And I know personally, I've done a lot of reading and educating, trying to educate myself over the past um, couple of years. And, you know, it's a, it's a journey. Um, and we're continuing, continuously trying to learn and, and better educate yourself. Um, so uh, yeah, as for how to overcome when you get, um, have encountered challenges, um, ugh, I don't know that I'm really qualified to answer that because it's, it's, you know, in some cases it's, um, you know, trying at a, at, at, a, at a level where we are trying to educate people within our community. Um, you know, I think we're trying to be strategic and recognize that people are coming from different places and are at different places in their journey and um, provide education um, as we move along. Um, Jess and Demarise, anything you can want to add to that? Demarise, you go. Thank you, Jessica. So one thing that I want to say is that um, I think it's important for leaders, right, in, in these agencies to be on board. I feel that if they're not on board, then it is it is, it is a constant struggle. Um, now, uh, in my agency at Valley Water, we just um, had our have our first uh, one of yeah, the first African American CEO at the agency. So he often starts his town halls talking about race issues, and. He, uh, it's interesting because he mentioned to us that staff is telling him, why are you talking about this? Why don't you concentrate about just being a CEO, right? And he had a very good answer talking about how, you know, we all are trying to bring our whole selves to work. And when we are experiencing uh, issues in the community, when we see things in the community that are not fair for the different, you know, communities being Latino, being African-American, it impacts, it impacts our work, right? And the way we handle ourselves. So. To me, that empowered me, right? Empower me and it made me feel like I can do what I'm doing <laughs> and I'm not gonna, gonna get in trouble. It doesn't mean that people are, are not pushing against it, but as long as we have that leader there, right? That he's talking about these issues, I feel that I can talk about them too. So I just wanted to add that. Let me move on to another question here. 
Um, kind of similar vein, can you provide an example of a local floodplain management policy that addresses social justice or equity? A policy. Have you seen or heard anything uh, that? Uh, I'm not, I'm not having anything come to mind right um, right now. Um, I do know you know there's there's a lot more effort to do things like um, as local communities or states are updating their state hazard mitigation plans to figure out how to be more inclusive and who's at the table. Um, for planning. Um, I know I live in Pennsylvania and, um, you know, that was one of the topics we just talked about, um, in our, um, annual review with FEMA, um, uh, different issues of equity. Um, so I, I think that's a great idea for the social justice task force to consider, you know, coming up, I trying to identify where there might be model, um, policies that we can try and highlight for our membership. There are a lot of um, organizations in California, agencies and organizations that they have policies, for example, the California Coastal Commission, and they, they're the ones who determine whether and how you can develop along the coastline. They have policies around environmental justice and equity, and same thing with the uh, Bay Conservation Development Commission, and they determine and regulate where and how you can develop along the shoreline, and that now includes equity. So these organizations have been doing big looks at themselves like Eileen described American Rivers has done and they've come up with uh, policies and they they're not specifically floodplain management policies but they uh, intersect the space that all of us work in along the, the shoreline the um, a, a comment couple of things related to the the, the uh, work group here is the um, comment that it'd be great to have a DEIJ section added to the insider or news and views. So uh, maybe your your uh, task force can take that back. Uh, but also somewhat on the same vein, has the committee, and I know the committee is relatively new, has the committee considered ways to make ASFPM membership, certification, participation in the conference, et cetera, more financially accessible to professionals and vulnerable communities? I think I saw that question pop up in another uh, session as well. Uh, has the task force ventured down that at all or had any conversations or do you know if ASFPM has? Um, the task force has not had a uh, conversation about that topic yet. And I mean, we, you know, we just created last year, so we definitely have not had time to dive into all the various issues that we would like, um, like to discuss and figure out where, where we should be moving forward. Um, as for your comments about the news and views, um, our, our executive office team um, uh, uh, delegate <laughs> on the task force is uh, Mary Bart, who's in charge of our newsletter. So we have already discussed um, how we can better feature some of these issues and upcoming issues. Awesome, that is great to hear. Uh, from everyone's real world experience to work with disadvantaged communities, this is from Brian Jones to improve equity. How common is it for the privileged communities in your area to advocate against your efforts? Like, why are you spending money on this type argument? Have you had anything like that or any pushback? Um, I don't generally work at that local level, so maybe I'll kick it to Jessica or Damaris if you have that experience. I think Damaris has some experience with that. Yeah. Um, so, not specifically to the point that the person raised, I cannot see your name, sorry. Uh, but um, so what I've seen, uh, which bothers me, right, is that uh, usually the wealthy communities, they have the connections, right? They have the voice, they have the ear of the board. Uh, so usually, and they time. Uh, and they usually send, when we're working on a project, flood protection project, they send lots of letters, they attend all the meetings that we have. And uh, so, projects start getting shaped to kind of um, basically benefit those communities because the other communities, the communities that usually don't have the, 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 you know, the means or underserved communities 
just don't have either the time because, you know, many of them are working two or three jobs. I know that from my family, right? Um, they just don't have all these resources. It's not easy for them to go. We don't make it easy for them to go. So we don't hear to their, their concerns. So that was kind of the first wake up call for me as I was working as a project manager to see the difference in treatment, not intendedly. We're not doing it because of we want to, we want to do this, but because of the access, right? And the, the, I, I, uh, the privilege that these people have, or they, you know, perceive that they have. So that I, I, I know that doesn't answer directly your question, but that's been my experience directly on the ground. Well, unfortunately, again, lots of more questions that can be asked. Uh, you can join the social justice working group. Um, I don't know if Eileen or Jessica, you have access to uh, the chat since we're in a different room, but if you do, maybe you can stick in the forms before I kind of clear out all the um, items. That way, if you want to join, please do. Uh, I raised my hand after hearing all these. I said, I got to get involved. So um, if anything, just to learn. So thanks again, Eileen and, and you three for helping me answer the questions. Uh, and this will bring us to our final presentation uh, around equity and social justice. And, this, and here, we're going to hear what FEMA's Risk Management Directorate or as some of us know it as RMD, is going to uh, gain a better, what they're doing to gain a better understanding on how to become more centered on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, Paul Wong gave us a little glimpse into those efforts uh, in the previous uh, plenary, but to help present what RMD is doing, we've got P Peter Herrick, who is the communications lead for RMD, Bradley Dean, he's a communications and partnership specialist there at RMD, and Selena Wright, who is the VP and, and multicultural lead over at Ogilvy. So uh, let's uh, sit back and listen to this last one and learn what uh, RMD is doing in this arena. Hi, I'm Peter Herrick. I'm the communications lead for the Risk Management Directorate. We're going to talk to you today about laying the foundation for an equity-centered RMD. I'm joined by Bradley Dean and Selena Wright. Brad, if you want to introduce yourself. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. My name is Bradley Dean. I'm a communications and partnership specialist with FEMA's Risk Management Directorate, and I help lead the Resilient Nation Partnership Network. Hi, everyone. I'm Selena Wright, and I'm with Resilient Action Partners, and I am here to talk about equity with you today. So before we dive into equity and what that means for us, let's talk about why we started undertaking this. A few years ago, we started having, some, started having some conversations and it became obvious that we need to do more in the equity space. We need to do more in terms of how we deliver our programs. We need to do more in terms of how we make resources available and how we better support communities and individuals to actually address their flood risk and their risk reduction opportunities. And so you may notice that uh, I am not the, the poster child for somebody who would lead equity. And so that meant that we needed to do a lot of research. And I started asking for more and more help, which is how we ended up with Selena here on this panel and a handful of other people that you don't see here who helped lay the foundation for us to talk about equity. Now, when I say that RMD recognized the need, it meant that we needed to take more opportunity and more effort to invest in, in ways to take more equitable approach to informing program delivery, risk reduction activities, communications, and more. And we recognize that while building an understanding of what equity means for the directorate, Contrasted with events over the past year and longer, it made it more obvious, not just to us, but to more and more people in society, that we need to talk about what equitable delivery of these resources looks like and how we do more to incorporate equity into our work. Being more equity centered for us is necessary to, changing the, to meet the changing needs of the US population. The demographics of the communities that we serve and the workforce that makes up Risk Management Directorate are changing. And that means that the values are changing, the needs are changing, the resources and the skill sets are changing, and we need, need to do more to meet and augment them as necessary. In order to take an equity-centered approach, we need to redefine how we're investing mitigation dollars and advancing resilience for the whole community. That requires a change in our thinking and our approach, especially during a time when resources aren't getting more abundant. If you look at the graphic here from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, you'll see that Equality and equity are often used interchangeably, and I'll admit that a few years ago, I didn't quite understand the difference. I feel like this graphic does a really good job of summarizing that they're connected, but again, not interchangeable. The implementation of one over the other leads to, drama leads to dramatically different outcomes for underserved and historically marginalized populations. 
equality means that each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. And that's, that's the foundation that I was used to several years ago. Equity recognizes that for each person has different circumstances and that, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocate, that we allocate resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. As you can see here, giving everybody the same bike, while equal, doesn't mean the same opportunity. Doesn't mean that everybody gets to go the same distance. Doesn't mean that everybody has as easy of a time moving forward on that bike. But if we take the equitable approach and match the needs that people have with the capabilities that they have, it means that we get to a different outcome. And that's really the difference that I look at the lens through. Equality comes from a lens of equal provision and equity comes from an outcome of trying to make sure that we have equal outcomes. So there are a number of quotes that talk about what equity means. Um, two of them are here from two folks that Brad is gonna talk about a little bit later. But it, it means that equity is not impartiality in our program delivery. It requires intentional outreach and commitments to dedicate time and resources to the people that need the most. While equality aims to promote fairness, it can only work if everyone starts in the same place and needs the same type of support. And we know that that's not true. Equity means removing barriers and obstacles so that people and communities can succeed. Again, back to that equal outcomes component. This quote from Valerie Novak here on the left about communities experiencing the same disasters but not having the same experience really resonates for me in all of the times I've responded to disasters in my time with FEMA the way people are impacted by disasters are based on a number of things and can vary based on their age, their income, their education, their neighborhood, their access to community resources. And so people that experience the same disaster are actually starting from a very different point in their recovery and have very different options going forward to find and accomplish resilience. And it's with this understanding that we're starting to craft what equity means to us in the risk management director. That I will turn it over to Celine. Thank you so much, Peter. So RMD reviewed best practices and connected with about 25 partners to better understand what worked for them. So these partners are a mix of those who are a part of FEMA's partnership network, which Brad will talk to in a few, um, or they've demonstrated being um, equity centered um, more from uh, more than uh, from a regulatory position. So those with the asterisks are uh, those that we reviewed for best practices, but may not be uh, a partner of FEMA's, but they're a best in class for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in order to better understand the current state of RMD, um, uh, uh, as far as the planning ahead for diversity, equity, and inclusion, we looked at some secondary research and collaborated with partners. So with secondary research, uh, we looked at um, uh, those that were in uh, government, business, and nonprofit, and uh, saw the, uh, the, the current themes uh, for those that were uh, doing equity-centered work. So being a champion for everyone was a theme that we saw through, throughout the industries, and tapping into potential um, in people and processes was another theme. And the last theme was improving quality of life for internal and external stakeholders. So these six that are listed here uh, proved to be best in class across various industries. We were also able to look at what some of the key insights were uh, as we dug deep into uh, these organizations. The first being that change begins at the top. So many times we love to ensure that we are co-creating and bringing in the right people when we're making um, changes within an organization. But with equity, because it needs to be uh, a level of commitment that has to be made for resources, as well as consistency throughout, change has to come from the top. Uh, the second key insight is that integration is all inclusive. So everyone really plays a role. It's not something that's relegated to a uh, human resources function, but everyone truly plays a role for um, an inclusive environment. Success must be measured and accounted for. Uh, it should be something that's tied to performance metrics, or at least tied to, uh, pro uh, in some ways, tied to pro programmatic metrics as well. Uh, reputation is earned by working together, that's the fourth. And fifth is educational goals must be defined, so that's inclusive of trainings. 
The sixth is communication is an ongoing effort. And the seventh is emerging issues and trends represent change. So where we are right now will look differently from where we are uh, in the future. And that's just a shift in the population and shift in public demand. So uh, it is something that strategically has to be uh, evaluated along the way. So we also wanted to take those seven key insights that I just talked through and see how they stood up against folks within our industry. So we tapped into some of the partners within the uh, partnership network, had conversations with them and collaborate, collaborated with them to determine if uh, the, kept, the seven key insights uh, were relevant um, to our industry and they were. They helped to validate that secondary research. Um, so what we've done is uh, we, we looked at secondary research, we looked at what it meant for our partners. Um, so I wanna now pass it to Brad who will talk through how this looks and shows up in our uh, everyday work. Thanks, Selena. Yeah, the next step really for us was, was to figure out how to put what we've learned, uh, what we've been exposed to into action and actually deliver on uh, some of the things that we're trying to to convey. So uh, first, I'd like to highlight um, our new guides to expanding mitigation, which are is a series designed to highlight uh, innovative and emerging partnerships for mitigation, like art, public health, municipal financing, transportation, and of course the whole community and equity. Uh, these resources highlight how states, localities, tribes. Uh, and territories can better support hazard mitigation projects and planning by engaging other sectors they may not have in the past, uh, which exposes themselves to new perspectives, new partners, and needs of those they are trying to reach. Uh, specifically, the guide uh, on equity, making connection to equity, it shows how uh, we can partner with the whole community to strive for equity and hazard mitigation, uh, including the planning and project development processes. Um, this guide, I wanna highlight, this guide is really a starting place for readers uh, to initiate a conversation about mitigation investments that make communities more equitable uh, and more resilient so that we can avoid situations in which risk reduction measure, measures negatively impact the people that they are intended to protect. Um, next, uh, I wanted to highlight how this task of achieving whole community resilience, it cannot be undertaken by one organization alone, and that everyone has a unique role to play in creating a more equitable and resilient nation. Um, one of the things that uh, we as the Risk Management Directorate undertook in 2015 was the creation of the Resilient Nation Partnership Network uh, as a platform to bring new and unique voices to the table that we may have not partnered with or in the past. And so we have several channels for communications to engage partners throughout the thought leadership process or providing open dialogue. Um, we have the Resilient Nation Roundup monthly newsletter we have our resilience exchange webinar events uh, where we've addressed topics such as impact investing for resilience, which highlighted um, you know, environmental, social, and governance investing, uh, the task force on climate uh, disclosure, and, and more. We have also uh, just recently held our next generation of resilience student showcase. That was the first time we undertook that. Uh, and that was a big success. And upcoming on May 19th, we have an event on seismic risk. Um, and of course, we have our annual partnerships forum. And so we wanted to advance the equity conversation, but we also understood that as a directorate and, and the network as a whole, uh, we were still learning. And so what was the best way for us to take that first step? And, and that was for us to assume a role of a convener and leveraging the Resilient Nation Partnership Network to create a virtual series to host a much needed conversation on equity and steps we could take towards actionable change. And so by bringing together this uh, network of diverse organizations and individuals, 
our platform was really able to elevate these critical issues and do that keeping partners at the forefront of the conversation. And so every Wednesday uh, this last October, uh, we hosted the, our Alliances for Equity virtual forum series in partnership with NOAA. We had uh, approximately 2,200 viewers uh, who represented 500, over 500 organizations attend the series over the four weeks. Uh, it was very, very diverse. I think one of the things that we really learned uh, from this event was that resilience and equity have no sector, that these are enterprise needs that should span all mission spaces. And so as we considered how to not only deliver this successful event, but and moving forward, it was critical for us to identify organizations that may have never interacted with FEMA before, or even many of our resilience partners, or may not necessarily have seen resilience as part of their mission space. And how could we bring them to the network and how can we bring them uh, to this conversation on how resilience and equity uh, really intersect. And the results of that partnership for the Alliances for Equity series uh, and our network partners was the, uh, this outcome, the Building Alliances for Equitable Resilience resource, which includes guidance, perspectives, stories, uh, resources, and more. And with this information, uh, we really intend to inspire readers with actions and considerations for equitable practices they can take today uh, and use as part of their day-to-day -day activities. Um, the resource, and I think this is the, the, the biggest success out of all of this, was the resource was co-created with 26 external organizations uh, with significant contributions from our partners at the Institute for Diversity and Inclusion, uh, uh, Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management. Uh, so Chauncey Willis highlighting the differences between equity and equality. Uh, Georgetown University, the office, the FEMA's Office of Equal Rights, All Aces Inc. So Dr. Atia Martin talking about unconscious bias. Um, the Center for American Progress, we highlighted Valerie earlier and talking about access and functional needs and how her personal story uh, and how she it, she became interested in pursuing that as part of her career. Um, the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. I think this is one of my favorite stories. When we spoke to Jake White, he, he said, he's like, hey, um, this sounds really interesting, but I'm, I'm not an expert on, on hazard mitigation or resilience. And I was like, don't worry, you know, we have that covered, right? If, if NOAA and FEMA can't provide some expertise on hazard mitigation and resilience, I think we have bigger problems. What we needed from Jake was to be an expert in how to engage and connect with Latino communities. And that's exactly what he brought to the table. And as he dug through his organization, he realized that many of his colleagues were experiencing these types of issues. And for instance, in Miami, you know, lower socioeconomic areas are a lot, uh, are really Latino communities there. But as we think about climate gentrification and sea level rise, those areas are becoming very desirable for developers and really displacing a lot of those populations. And as he dug in, he started to realize how resilience was part of their equity initiatives and, and how there was alignment to their mission. And it was, a really, it was a really great moment for all of us. And I think a lot of organizations are experiencing that not, with, not only with resilience, but equity as well. Um, we also had uh, insights from the Institute for Tribal Environmental uh, Professionals and Nikki Cooley and the National League of Cities. And so this resource was released just a couple weeks ago, and you can find it on our Resilient Nation Partnership Network website. We're really proud of it. Um, I hope you take a look at it. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Selena. So as we get ready to wrap up, obviously, you can see our contact information here. Um, you've heard us say that we've done some pretty cool things in the equity space, but I hope that you also heard us say that we're not the experts here. As Brad said, 26 different organizations came together for the resource that he pulled together after the Alliances for Equity Forum in October. Um, we don't pretend to be the experts on it. We recognize the need for it and are going to continue to push for it. And that means being more collaborative in every sense of the word and understanding what equitable delivery means and then in delivering it. Um, so our information is here. Give us a call. Give us a shout. Our phone numbers are here. Give us an email. 
Um, if you want to talk about what equity means for us, for your organization, for program delivery, or in general, we're happy to answer the questions that we can. And quite frankly, to put you in touch with somebody smarter than us, if that's what's called for. Um, we're happy to be a facilitator here. I, I appreciate the time. I know we're going to have some dialogue here, but I want to really stress equity is a hard thing, much like resilience. It's not a thing that you ever cross a finish line and say that you're done. It's just a thing that you continue to get better at, and that's okay. Um, we're starting on this journey. We hope that you're going to come with us because equitable delivery is going to be important for all of us as organizations, for the populations that we serve, for our missions, and for resilience as a whole. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to the live versions of ourselves to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. The best dressed person attending the forum this year was going to be Peter Herrick, but he decided to take off his jacket, which I don't know if I've seen you in one before, and um, a little handkerchief and everything and put on what he had before. So anyway, you're still looking good, Peter, and uh, let's jump into those questions for sure. Uh, and speaking of the Alliance, um, and I, I'll see who wants to answer this one. Uh, the, the person, Ned, was saying that the Alliances for Equity series was very useful, just like I was saying. Uh, will it continue? Uh, and I, I think a lot of people, it's like Netflix, will the series continue? It was great. Uh, tell us. Yeah, I, I, thanks, Bruce. I think I can take that one. So, Ned, first, I'm glad that the series, that you found the series useful. I think I think a lot of us did. It was it was really incredible to to put that together and probably the greatest learning moment from all of those amazing people. Um, we It is unlikely that we will be doing a specific Alliances for Equity event again, but what our plan is, is as we, as we mentioned in the presentation, is to make equity and resilient, like equity, a enterprise priority throughout the Resilient Nation Partnership Network. So as we go out, as we go through all of our other resilience topics, equity becomes an underlying theme that we that we weave throughout. So um, we have the three priorities. One of them is advancing um, equitable initi uh, equitable resilience initiatives. So I, I hope that answers your question. All right. Uh, Robin wants to know, have there been discussions of including social vulnerability into the theme of benefit cost analysis? We've had some discussion on that. Um, have we gotten into that detail of looking at it at this point? Um, so I'm happy to start with this and Brad may have some more to add. The short answer is, I don't know that we're the right people to answer that question. So that's something that falls within the mitigation directorate and we're the risk management directorate and not to make it sound like we're pawning it off on somebody else, but I don't want to speak on their behalf. I know that for FIMA as a whole, we have equity as a part of our priorities in the strategic plan. What that looks like for their programs and what the timeline may or may not be, I just don't know enough to be able to answer that question. But Brad, I feel like you may have some more information. I, I'm still going to rely on the, I am not the right person to answer this, but I do, I do know that uh, our colleagues over in the hazard mitigation assistance uh, program are looking into um, how to make the program delivery more equitable. And I don't know if we can get some information uh, from uh, whoever answered, asked that question, but we'd happy to, we'd be happy to make that connection. I, I am confident and can say yes, though that is being uh, looked into, um, but I cannot speak to any like actionable outcomes that have come out of that work. Right. Um, what, what in FEMA falls under the purview of the office of the director? I'm not sure on that office of, because you guys are RMD is direct. Do you want to take that, Peter? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the risk management director is the, the flood hazard mapping program, natural hazard risk oh, program, earthquakes, um, essential, essentially natural hazard risk reduction, um, because benefit cost analysis ties into grants that falls under hazard mitigation assistance and the BRIC program and others. Um, our focus is more on the assessment, communication, understanding of risk, um, but the grant program component would have to fall in the mitigation. Right. Thanks. Are there any... Um, B, uh, C -Cord asks, uh, are there specific activities or resiliency task forces that will expand across all FEMA regions with an emphasis on diversity specific to those regions. So what's being done on the regional perspective? Yeah, so I'm happy to start with this one too and Brad can jump in as well. Um, this is something that the Alliances for Equity thing was a huge step forward for us and I'm happy to admit like 
something that we should have done a long time, but was a huge step forward for us in October. Uh, you heard some of the research that we've been doing since that time in advance of that that series. And our conversation now is about where where do we go as an organization? How do we set clear definitions for ourselves? What does it look like in work plans? And as we've engaged with our regions, asked a lot of questions about how they get more information, what this means for them, what resources are going to be available. And in the best possible way, we've been overwhelmed with requests and direction and there becomes a bandwidth issue. And so we're having conversations now about what that looks like in practice, how we can stack for priorities. Obviously we want to do all of these things, but it comes down to a matter of how do we best allocate our resources. What I can tell you is that we've provided a lot of resources to the regions in terms of education. And our conversations now are centered around how can we support them effectively with tools, resources, information, um, how can they talk through the Resilient Nation Partnership Network at their level to convene some people? And what does that look like for them? Um, again, timeline is very fun. I don't want to overpromise, with, especially considering we're the government. Um, but it's a priority that we're starting to figure out what the right answer looks like for us and how we apply resources to it. Um, a, a comment about EPA, they have an environmental justice assessment tool and, and they actually have I've attended their environmental uh, assessment um, uh, webinars. Is there a, uh, which are fascinating for those who haven't seen it, is there a similar reflective tool that uh, FEMA has pulled together to help with uh, equity and disaster reduction? Are there anything not, you guys want to Not on? yet. Yeah, not yet. The agency has gone out, and this, this again falls outside of our purview. The agency has gone out and is starting to gather more information about the ways in which equity applies across all FEMA programs. Um, obviously, there's an increased emphasis as it relates to response and recovery activity because there's a lot of attention for the agency. For us, we obviously have a role in that space. We've started to engage with the Office of Equal Rights and the Office of uh, policy analysis to figure out what that means for us and what information we need to be more introspective and to be able to apply some of these tools. Those are just the initial stages for the agency as a whole. There's a, a comment. I don't know if they, if they if you wish to comment on it. Is is uh, it would be great if the various FEMA mitigation programs would work together on equity, as many of these programs overlap. Uh, it, 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 is FEMA looking to do that? Do you have a higher up group that's making sure one group's talking to the other? Yeah, so while we may have spearheaded the, the public facing nature through the Alliances for Equity component, this is absolutely a, a cross FEMA initiative. And you heard me talk just a second ago about how it's also a cross FEMA initiative. Um, all those pieces together is obviously difficult, but Brad can talk a little bit about the amount of collaboration that happened going into the Alliances for Equity component across FEMA help articulate like we've absolutely been having those conversations you were to say we know that these are priorities for some of those programs but we're not sure where they are in terms of what their timeline may look like but brad i don't know if you want to add more on the collaboration side yeah from from this perspective of like risk management director at FIMA, we actually uh set up like a planning an internal planning committee uh, that included like our environmental and historic preservation. Uh, one of the folks over there that does work in environmental justice. Um, we we were co consistently hearing from partners that this was a priority. So we had just that organic feedback that we had accumulated over time. Uh, we had representation from uh, each of our FIMA directorates, our Office for the Flood Insurance Advocate, and, and others. And we did bring even uh, leadership across resilience into the conversation as well. So. The equity piece, as Peter identified, like as Peter mentioned, is is a huge. It's it's a priority for FEMA. It's growing. There's a lot of people that are working on it and identifying opportunities for us to to leverage the various work that is going on in this space. Uh, so I would imagine that I, I'm like Peter. I'm not going to be able to provide a timeline, but I would imagine that you're going to be seeing some some really cool things that come out over you know sometime in the future. So we're running out of time, but a quick question here for you. Um, so with all of this, how has FEMA been tailoring um, the communication and engagement efforts to address the diverse needs of the audiences? Real quickly. Yes, yeah, so the, the real quick answer is we've started doing an audit on a lot of materials to make sure that we're speaking in a way, in a way that makes sense for all of our communities, that we are ensuring that we're incorporating equity in terms of our process for how we engage and starting to think through a lot of those things. Um, that audit is, I'd say it's in initial stages only because I envision it's a massive undertaking and progress on it. 
it it's about arming our our people on the ground in the regions who actually deliver who right. think through all of these things and make sure that their tools and resources reflect the equity component well, thanks again, Peter and Bradley and Selena. Uh, it's great to see the steps FEMA is taking to address DEIJ, uh, which is a new acronym for, for me. So uh, for everybody else, thanks for attending. Uh, this brings us to the end of the concurrent session and what a great session. And thank you uh, all of uh, our presenters today. And I hope our attendees will be walking away with something new that they learn and that their eyes are opened up a bit more to the social injustices and equities that are out there today. So I know my eyes uh, were opened up for sure. So thanks again, everybody, and, and have a good rest of the conference.